powered by Go Goat Sports in partnership with TSN Season 4, Episode 15, 1 5 of the Rain Dregs Hockey Podcast, presented by our title sponsor, Canadian Club Whiskey. The final release of their Chronicle series is there. It's ready for you. The 45 year old Canadian Club, a spectacular whiskey, is now available everywhere. So get to your local establishment, pick one up. Fine, fine gifting idea, Ray. A terrific, if if you get a bottle of the 45-year-old from someone, that's a special friend. That is somebody it, who's taken it the extra mile. It, it's such a good friend, you might even open the bottle and share it with that friend, as yeah. opposed to just having to hoard it. Yeah, because, just let's a be wee honest, dram, right? though, just a titch. Just, oh, just right? a little touch. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what a weekend uh, in hockey. The uh, Hall of Fame weekend, of course, mm-hmm. in Toronto. A terrific class. We know Cammy was part of the Legends mm-hmm. game and, uh, you know, was part of the weekend that was. It's a huge weekend, by the way, for the Vancouver Canucks with Henrik and Daniel and Roberto Luongo. We'll get into all of this as part of the headlines. But, mm-hmm. you know, one of our former guests on the Ray and Dregs podcast, Billy Clement, was also honored um you know the elmer ferguson and the foster hewitt presented to right. elmer ganty and bill clement as part of the media luncheon yesterday in toronto and i gotta tell you i was there i, I, I as best i can i try and attend that one especially i mean so right. many of these great broadcasters um and and writers you know, I remember growing up as a kid, and not that Al Morganti is like 50 years older than me, he obviously isn't, but, you know, just, I, I, I liked his sense of humor, right? So it's always nice to catch up with these guys, and Eric DeHatchick and Scotty Morrison, and all, all of the gaggle of old writers that are hanging around. But this would shock you absolutely zero. <laughs> you know, Bill Clement gets up there to, oh. you know, for his accepted speech, and man, <laughs> is he so good you know he just he's got that room in the palm of his hand he could have talked for 30 minutes an hour and people would have been guffawing and and having a good old time but you know you look at so many of those good people who are honored members now of the hockey hall of fame and and often it fits if not every single time but bill clement and al morganti especially billy just so appreciative right because you would understand this. Like he came from the playing career where he's a pretty good hockey player mm-hmm. to, you know, dabbling in acting and everything else. And and then has had a pretty established broadcast career over the last few decades as well. Well, I, you know, I, I've known Bill for a long time. And when we had him on our podcast, and really we should have him on again because he was oh, just so good, just so outstanding. Um, yeah. But I didn't realize his story. Mm-hmm. Then, you know, like he had retired and went into business and he was bankrupt and basically had to reinvent a anything career. And it turned out to be acting and he was in a yeah. bunch of commercials. And then he went on, you know, got into broadcasting and um, had a long, successful career. I mean, when when Bill was at ESPN, uh, the first go around, um, you know, I mean, he was it. He was, you know, he was the number one guy. And. Um, powerful, powerful personality. I worked with him at yeah. NBC a little bit and he's just, he's just funny. He just like he, and he's got a, you know, I mean, he could talk to you about taking the garbage out and you'd fall over and laugh. <laughs> and it's just, um, he's a good man. And uh, Al Morganti was a Titan um, when he was, he was. I mean, yeah. it, it, like if Morganti had it, that was like, that's where it needed to come from. And right. uh, congratulations to them. And, and certainly to all of the the player cl- and builder class as well that uh, were inducted. That the weekend is always so fun. I mean, I've I've been there only a couple of times. One with Cami and uh, one other time, and um, just seeing everybody around and people are happy to see each other. And um, yeah, it's a and the hall's the hall. If honestly, <laughs> if you haven't gotten there and you're you know and you're listening to this, try and get yourself to go visit it. It's really astounding to look at, at the stuff and wander through it's a great day and and you know ray i i you know because i'm primarily based out of the greater toronto area anytime i have family or friends who who come to visit obviously it's it's on the list of things you have to do right you've got to go to the hockey hall of fame and i always say to them all right well if you really want to spend time there then give yourself the full day 
or yeah. split the date because there is so much to see there that you, you just can't peruse, right? You can't just kind of window shop and, and, you know, you can spend 20 minutes reading everything about Wayne Gretzky, if not longer. So right. anyway, you're right. It's a special place. Headlines again this season brought to you by our good friends at Boston Pizza. And, and we're going to start headlines um, expectedly so with a bit of a, a Hall of Fame theme. But I... I want to to rewind back to Friday night. We did the Hall of Fame game on, on TSN, and that was the Pittsburgh Penguins in Toronto to face the Toronto Maple Leafs. Um, I'm not going to lie. I wasn't expecting this night to be as emotionally charged as it was, and and it's obvious why it was that way. To see Borea Salming, the great Borea Salming, standing on the ice, flanked by Matt Sundin and Daryl Sittler and, and all of those wonderful players out there. And the ovation, which was seemingly endless for Salming and, and Sittler weeping, right? Like sobbing as he's trying to help his good friend acknowledge the crowd by, by holding up his arm. Um, and then just to, to see just the sheer love for being, well, back in his hockey home. Of, of Toronto was just something else. There literally wouldn't have been a dry eye in the house, including the ink stain wretch that I am and others were around our set watching this all unfold. But, but that's kind of part of what this weekend is meant to be and part of, right? Well, it is. And, you know, however, this was just, um, you know, this was just different. You know, like yeah. uh, to see, I, I don't think any of us um, really had the, well, no, nobody really had the knowledge of, of in what condition Borea was in, um, given the, you know, the reports that he had uh, been diagnosed with ALS. And um, I, I don't know, I, in my head, I had it, had him not as far advanced as he Agreed. was. Yeah. And maybe I was hoping that. Um, but to see him and to see the, the devastation that that disease has on people, um, mm. certainly, you know, in the hockey community, Mark Curtin has been a outspoken advocate just for support and courage is just remarkable what Mark has done. And to see Borea, you know, I played against him for four years, five years and, uh, right at the end of his career, you know, he'd gone a little bit in Toronto, but then went to Detroit. But he mm -hmm. was just, um, there was something about him, like you'd look at him on the ice and he, like literally he was the king. I mean, they, that's yeah. what they called him, right? His nickname was King. And um, yeah. um, like he just, he just commanded. And this wasn't even at the peak of his career. If you want to see something that's really cool, go back to the 76 Canada Cup and just, you can Google it and Google, um, Salming's ovation when he gets introduced first against the United States and then against Canada. And um, uh, people from Sweden said that was the first time that they realized what impact Borea Salming had in North America. Like they didn't know because the internet wasn't around and yeah, you know, yeah, he's yeah. playing in Toronto and yeah, I'm sure it's a big deal. And they just about took the place down when, when he was introduced and uh, it was, it's just, it's so sad, but I'm really, I, I'm happy he was able to see and process how much love there is for him. Yeah. And, and for Daryl and the players that knew him and played with him, um, you know, I, I mean, it was off the charts, emotional for them. Mm -hmm. Cammy was at the game and she said there, you know, she looked around and there was not anybody without no. a teary eye. Like they just, no. they just, uh, just wish him and his family, all the all the best that there that there can be. How did uh, Cammy participated in the Legends game? Um, I mean, it had so many <laughs> interesting elements to it. You know, historically that game. Eh, I mean, for guys like us, Ray, you know, of course you have a vested interest in it because Cammy's participating, and I, you know, I think we're all pretty eager, intrigued to see Roberto Luongo play as a forward. And damn, he was pretty good. You know, as far as goalies turning forwards, I, I don't know that I should have been surprised. Well, but... you got to remember, though, when he retired, I think the first thing he do did was drive a stake through his goal pad so <laughs> that he would never be tempted to put him on again. So he plays down in Florida. I saw him actually a few weeks ago. He was 
it was after a morning skate. And I had a game there and he was walking in with his hockey bag and, and I said, where are the pads? And he's like, Oh, I don't have those anymore. And so like mm. he goes and he plays as a forward and uh, Cammy did have fun. Um, you know, as you get older, you're like, wow, my body doesn't move the same way it used to move. <laughs> <laughs> but she had a lot of fun. She was, you know, she played some with Daniel and Henrik and um, who, you know, she's, you know, we know well from here in Vancouver and, um, and certainly she's working with them right now, but um, she had, mm -hmm. she had a great time and she, um, she just said like the, you know, there was such a group of players that were all around the same age that they all came back to play for their, for their buddies that had been, or that were being inducted. And she said, it was just amazing to watch just um, how connected those guys were. Well, look at, I mean, two icons of the game, right? As captains in Matt Sandin and Eric Lindros, you know, if you, you can dust those two guys off to come out and play, you know, basically a charity game I mean, with all due respect. I mean, how do you say no, if you're asked and you're yeah. someone other than those guys, of course you're going to play. Well, okay. So this is how much Cami skates. And for those that know the way our house runs, this will not be a surprise. So they had a game, um, the Canucks played and she texts me, she's at the game. I'm at home with the boys. And she says, Hey, I forgot, um, my gear that I'm supposed to give to the trainer. They're bringing it on the trip for me. Uh, mm -hmm. could you go get it? So I'm like, yeah, sure. No problem. So I go get her gear and she, then she texts again and says, Hey, take a look just to make sure the skates are in there. So I take a look, they're not there. <laughs> so I'm like, well, where could they be? She said, probably in the coaches." the little coaching bag we have when you go on the ice. So I look there, of course they're not there. So now I got to look for her skates, which yeah. should tell you the last time she had them on. Yeah. So I'm looking around and I don't know. I, I look for a half hour dregs. I can't find them. And oh, I don't know right. why it clicks. I'm like, I think I saw them in the basement somewhere. Like what would they be doing there? Hockey gears in the garage. So I go down the basement. They're not there. Now I'm looking around. I'm kind of, I don't know, just wandering around. I open up the, closet in the guest room they're in the closet in the guest room like well, what would they be doing there perfect sense either that or the <laughs> freezer i mean where else would they do <laughs> so i pull them out i'm like yeah i got them she's like where'd you find like she had no idea but that's just kind of how our house works so we got them in the bag and off they went <laughs> another special moment is always the induction speeches right mm -hmm. and and just the acknowledgement of these great players and all those who have helped them get to this point hall of fame status um, Roberto was terrific as you'd expect him to be talked about how challenging it was, you know, Italian family, staunch Italian family to leave home <laughs> at 15. Right. And he acknowledged his Italian billets, which <clears throat> made a, a huge difference, I'm sure. But instantly as I'm watching, I'm thinking, hmm, I can I, I like you left home, Ray Ferraro, at an early age, but I couldn't remember if you were 15 or 16, but I that's a story I'd never heard from you. So to hear from Roberto, you were the first person I thought of. I almost texted you last night. Well, I, I love the speech. I thought, well, the speeches were great. They, they always are because they, I love the fact that the guys get the chance to talk about things that people just don't know about them and about their, their journey and the people that helped yeah. them and that sort of thing. So when I was 16, uh, I was going to go to Penticton, uh, which is about four hours from my hometown and my parents said no that they so i stayed home i stayed my dad said um you need to finish grade 11 before you can you can go so i stayed home at 16 and i didn't leave till 17 so roberto left 2 years before and i don't know this about roberto and and his you know the italian parents and his mom but i'm not even kidding here when i left at 17 it was the first time i'd never had my t-shirts and my underwear ironed <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea. I'm like, oh, this is how they do the laundry here, I guess. I had great billets, amazing people. Uh, Don and Laverne Brown in Penticton, they were just amazing people. But I'm like, <laughs> every other time, like Wednesday was ironing day. Mom would iron all the clothes in the laundry. Four boys plus dad. Of course, we're all wow. useless. We can't help it. She would carry, a, you know, those laundry baskets? They haven't improved since 1974. No, yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> Mom would iron she'd have a mom was five four she'd have a stack of laundry up over her head and she'd carry it upstairs us slobs would be watching tv and she would just walk right by us with the laundry you think somebody could have helped 
but mom ironed it all up and it was, and then, so I'm sure Roberto went away and he got Italian billets. So maybe he got eased in a little bit, but um, his that's, speech was see, terrific. That's where you get your cleaning chops from, right? I mean, you witnessed it firsthand, the attention oh. to detail. It all makes perfect sense now. Yeah. Poor, poor mom. No help. No help. <laughs> yeah, you're right. I mean, Roberto's speech was awesome as expected. Um, Daniel Sedin acknowledged, and I was a bit taken back by this. I don't know why I should be. They're twin brothers, obviously. But Daniel acknowledging that Henrik was a better hockey player. Okay, fair. Well, but you then he went on the to Hall say, of Fame. Hey, you both end up in the Hall of Fame, so you're, you're not so bad. Yeah, you're not so bad. He acknowledged that that Henrik was a better person. And I'm like, geez, that's a nice thing for a brother to say. And, and he went on to expand in, in how Henrik has been a calming influence for him on the ice, off the ice, all those things. And then Henrik gets the mic after Daniel and just spears him about four or five times. And I just chuckled because, I mean, you know the family well, but there is such a connection and bond between those men that now makes it make perfect sense how they had that sixth sense on the ice where one guy was going to be, where the other guy was going to be. And, and I mean, it was just poetry to watch them play in their prime. Uh, but to, to hear the acknowledgements and just the love pour through those two guys, even in a, in a fun natured way that, that made that speech, if not unique, certainly special for me to listen to. Well, of course it's unique though, Dregs. I mean, like yeah. they're twins and they're both in the hall of fame. You know, like yes, it's yeah. astounding. It's not like twins, Danny DeVito and Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? Like, you know, <laughs> by the way, good movie back in the day. Really um, good, yeah. Uh, but one thing that is, I, I don't think that people quite would understand, maybe they do now because there's been enough stories written about them, was how ultra competitive they are. Like even now, they run this trail here. It's called the Gross Grind. It goes up Gross Mountain. They race. Like they're not running up there together. They're racing <laughs> each other. And if somebody's ahead, the other guy's trying to catch them. Like it's, it's remarkable how they've pushed and prodded and, you know, helped each other along their way. They took a lot of crap in the early time of their, of their career here. And if you look at their pictures, when they came over, they were a couple of little chunky Swedish kids, right? It's like, you yeah. see the, not today, yeah. but used to be like these chunky kids that come into the NHL with all the little baby fat. Yeah. They're 18 years old. And they were no different than a Canadian kid or a U.S. kid that comes in at 18. And you then you look at pictures of them 10 years later. They're like, they're not even the same people. So it took them, like Henrik said, you know, at 23, we weren't, you know, we didn't think we were, we should be in NHL players. Like they, they, they were four or five years into their career. And I then know. they just exploded. And, you know, um, I, I do think one thing that, you know, you know, people like to people like to talk about people that are in the Hall of Fame about what they're not. And so, you know, you hear a little bit, well, they never won a Stanley Cup and Luongo didn't win a Stanley Cup. I think that's almost last for me, if I were voting, which I'm not, that's almost last in criteria for me. It's not the Hall of Fame of being a good teammate and being on the in the right place at the right time. Right. Sometimes you just you're not there. You're just not mm -hmm. the, the window is not there. If so Let's let's assume Henrik and Daniel just miss this, the Hall of Fame, among others. Luongo too, mm -hmm. they just miss. And somebody says, yeah, it's because they never won a cup. So you mean if they would have won game seven in 2011, they would have been in? One game matters whether you're in or out? It makes no sense to me. So I, I think the Hall of Fame should be, first of all, I don't think it should be for the good. I think it should be for the great. I think it should be for difference makers. It should be for I'm major award winners. Yeah. And I think somewhere along the way, the voting has kind of gone offline a little bit like that. Um, that would be my critique of it. Um, I'm glad those guys are in. I, I really am. I, I think they deserved it. They won a heart trophy. They won a scoring title. Luongo played, was playing 75 games a year. He gave our buddy Noodles a little kick in the shins there about the, the one game. He goes, you know, I was playing 75 games a year, so Noodles had to play five. <laughs> <laughs> but they were just like, they were, they were our great friends. And, um, yeah. Uh, you know, and then, you know, I, I also liked about Luongo talking about his goalie partners and yeah. what it's like to yeah. be, you know, buddies with the guy that you're playing a different position with. Yeah. And not overlooking Daniel Alfredson, Rika Salonen, or Daniel you know, Alfredson. The Carnegie family. Um, yeah. Of course, I played against Alfredson. He was good. 
and like also like fiercely competitive, right? Like I mean, way more competitive. Obvious, yeah. But yeah. but I, I I think we well me you know I've had a long vision of competitiveness about you know guys that would you know would be fighting and you know and I, you know I grew to realize that's not the case. I mean, remember when the Ottawa Toronto thing was at its height and um, uh, Alfredson had the broken stick that he was going to throw in this, you know, he pretended he was going to throw Mocking mats. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like it, like that, that was as heated as there was. Alfie was a, was a terrific player. And yeah. I'm going to say, I, I do hope that Rod Brindamore and Alex McGillney work their way, get enough votes to get in. I, I just, I think they both deserve to be, they were, they were amazing players in their day and they're, they're not in. And I look at the guys that are in and I'm like, those two, in my opinion, should be in. Mm -hmm. Well, fair enough. And again, I, that it matters because you know, you've, you've earned your opinion, but you also played against those men too. Right. So you got a front row seat and experience to how good they were. Yeah. McGillney was on a, on another planet. Like he was so good. And Brenda Moore was horrible to play against. Terrible. And which, of course, I mean, in the utmost respect, I was just like, yeah. he would, and he played 1500 games. Like he said, you know, a thousand points pretty much, you know, like, I don't know, he should be in. All right. Let's, let's take five minutes to just buzz around the league a little bit, because yep. there are a number of stories that we have to kick around here. Um, you know, not that long ago, we were talking about the St. Louis Blues and what the hell is going on with the St. Louis Blues. And we're listening to Ryan O'Reilly dive on the sword and, you know, Doug Armstrong having to talk to the players and give Craig Berube the vote of confidence. Well, all of a sudden, they've won three in a row. And maybe it's media fodder to pinpoint when one game can potentially be season-changing for you. If that's fair, then is that game last night? Because they play a really good Colorado Avalanche team, right? Jordan Bennington, I think, made 45 saves in that game. They've got a five-on-three. The Avs, that is, have a five-on-three, which I think actually turned into a six-on-three because they They pulled pulled the the goalie goalie late in the hockey game. (laughs) And they hold on to a 3-2 win. So, is again, is it just headline stuff that we in the media focus on when when a team that struggled of late, you know, starts to, to hit some momentum and maybe pushes that momentum to another level by beating the defending champs. Why? Well, I, I mean, let's let's give it a couple of weeks and see if that's you know this becomes a springboard uh, week or ten days for them with the three wins. Um, I watched the last half of the game last night. And they didn't have the puck much. No, like, you know when your goalie makes forty five saves, you're like, oh boy, he was really good. And Bennington mm-hmm. made a couple of fantastic saves. It was like it was like the Abs just kept coming in waves at them and St. Louis actually, um, you know, they had a chance though, in fairness to put the game away. Shen hit Luke, uh, Braden Shen hit the post with um, about four minutes left, hit the post, came straight back out. I'm trying to think who the forward was, was in behind the goalie was in behind Georgiev and he missed the puck. I mean, it should have been four two, but it wasn't. Um, But they showed, they showed a little bit of, a little bit of grit. I mean, they were, a little bit of heart. Um, yeah. Yeah. Justin Falk took a penalty and then um, I think it was Butchnevich bunted it over the glass. And so it was five on three for a minute 22. It's not like it was for 20 seconds. And they, they hung on McKinnon missed the net three or four times. Like there was rebounds around there. There was oh, all kinds of wild craziness, but it, it's interesting because they were probably one of those teams that if they didn't get it rolling fast, um, Doug Armstrong, I think, would have been really aggressive really soon. Mm. Like likely on the trade front? Yeah, I, I mean, like yeah. if you once you yeah. fall out of touch yeah. there, like if maybe that's the time to retool around the guys yeah. that you signed for eight years. You know, maybe yeah. you move some of your older guys. and mm-hmm. and it, But it's funny, though, because look, Toronto, I mean, no, we're going to get to Toronto here in a second. They got to find a defenseman and they got to find yeah. one. You know, well, maybe all of a sudden the Blues decide they're sellers and a few more guys pop up on the market that wouldn't might normally be there. Yeah. Okay. well, let's go to that because that's a a terrific segue. And I, you know, Dubas, Kyle Dubas continues to preach patience, right? Even though 
He's now got Jordy, um, not Jordy Ben, uh, yep. TJ Brody, oh. who's out. Um, uh, ben is healthy and actually scored the other night, but he's got TJ Brody out with an oblique injury, very similar to what John Tavares had early. So it's not expected to be an extended issue, but when you look but that at that, was about three weeks, Blue wasn't it, Drake? That was about yeah, three yeah, weeks, it's, wasn't it? it's at least two, two, three weeks. But when you look at that blue line and all the issues that they've had, and, and Muzzin out now, I mean, it feels like Muzzin's season is over and perhaps his career. We don't know that. Mm-hmm. And they've established that because of the, 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 the cervical issue that he has with the spine, um, he's going to have to be reevaluated by a specialist in Los Angeles in February. So, look, it's a, it's a tough one for Murray. Uh, but as Marner and everyone around the Maple Leafs has already established, this isn't about hockey, right? He's got kids. He's got family. You know, he he just, Muzzin simply has to look after what's best for the rest of his life. So if it's safe to assume he's done for the year, there's no choice, right? Kyle yeah. Lewis, whether he wants to be patient or not, is going to have to find something to help them out on the back end. So with Jake Muzzin, I didn't think their defense was good enough. Um yeah to be what they think they are or they aspire to be. Um, And that's a team that can go deep in the playoffs. Um, I look at that defense as it's currently constructed and I'm like, I don't know. Can they, how are they going to defend in a playoff series? Mm -hmm. You know, when they, when the games legit get tougher, like they're just harder, the forwards get to the net a little more with a little more aggressiveness. Are you going to be able to rely on Justin Hall and Timothy Lilligren and, Mm -hmm. um, uh, Rasmus Sandin, like, are you going to be, are you going to be able, is Mark Giordano, I mean, he's the oldest player in the league. Is he going to be able to, to withstand it? I, and yeah. look, I think the guy's fantastic. I, like I, he's, he's been terrific since he's come to Toronto. He's had a, had a great career, but you're asking a lot. Um, yeah. If he's going to be one of your top four guys playing 22 minutes a night. So they get, so it's easy to say, okay, they got to go get somebody, but to go get somebody, that means it's going to cost you somebody. Sure. Or more yeah. than somebody. They don't have a lot of assets that they can trade. They don't have a lot of draft picks. I mean, can you blow out another first rounder? Oof. And if and if you look at some of their the the better end of their prospects, they're all about five foot eight. Yeah. Like I, I'm telling you, look, I am a I am a supporter of if small guys everywhere. But you don't see many Stanley Cup teams with a bunch of five foot eight guys. You just right. don't. No, it just, you just no. it just doesn't happen. So, which guys can you move if you if you deplete one area to fix another, then then you're depleted somewhere else. I mean, they're mm-hmm. they're walking a tightrope here, but uh, as you said, Drake's, I just they don't really have a choice. Now the trick becomes, who can you target, and when can you target? Because teams that might be sellers later on in the year are not right now, and maybe they can mm-hmm. go through for three, four, five, six weeks. You know, they can hold their hold their head now while Brody gets back and then they can hold their head for a few more weeks. And the longer they wait, you know, that accrues, you know, some more time to collect cap space. And although they're in LTI anyway, so like Mm -hmm. there's not it's not going to be an easy deal to make. And it's going to be a costly one, because if me and you were talking about, you know, their um, urgency to add a defenseman, do you think the other teams know? And so they're going to yeah. go, oh, yeah, you need my D-man, do you? Have I got a deal for you? Sure, Kyle, I'll help you out. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, let's wrap up headlines with the Vancouver Canucks. And uh, they wind down their road swing in in Buffalo tonight. Uh, so we'll see how that goes. I, I don't really think that it's going to have much bearing on what's likely next in Vancouver. And we've talked a fair bit about the future of Bruce Boudreaux as head coach of the Vancouver Canucks. And most recently I said, look, it's, it's, it's likely going to be above all else, a timing issue. Um, you know, what point do the Vancouver Canucks rely mostly on the draft? And, you know, are you better if there's a person available that you think is going to help you in desperation, try and salvage this season, or do you just take it on the chin, hold with Bruce until you can't hold anymore. And then, make the decision perhaps in the new year. That was last week. That's where my mind was, Ray. I'm in a different place as we record episode 15 on Tuesday. And I'm not so sure we won't be talking about 
a coaching change on Thursday. Not to make light of it, um, but I think Bruce knows what's coming. Um, and let me ask you this. By this point in this process, the players know, right? They can feel it, and, and they're likely expecting a change in some description as well in the near future. The, um, when a team struggles, the, the players start to anticipate and feel and smell. It's like you can, you know, they say you can smell fear. Like you yeah. can smell it. It's just there. And whether it's a coaching change or a trade, players start to, they start to talk about it in all their spare time. I mean, that becomes the, um, that becomes the number one topic for, for players as this stuff is swirling around. And that's when it was that way when I played, of course, it's going to be this way now when every time they open up some of their social media, it's at the, it's at the top of their chain. So it's a, it's a hard spot to be in, uh, of course, because that means your team's not playing very well, makes you take a deep look at their, at your own team. Um, plus it's easy to say, oh, we got to fire the coach. Well, then who's going to coach? Yeah. You can't just say, well, we'll figure it out. So do you hire Do you hire a veteran coach? Well, a veteran coach is looking for three or four years, I assume. Like they're mm-hmm. not coming in for six weeks. No. Or do you have an interim coach mm-hmm. and just try to right the ship and, as you say, get, get into a position where you start selling some assets and try to collect some draft picks and and again, like there's lots of articles written this, written about this stuff. I, I wonder if the people writing them understand you can't just trade guys away to get draft picks. No, has anyone noticed the other articles they're writing about no cap space? Like you've got, yeah. there's no room. Like you've no. got, so it's it's way harder, way harder than it should be to make a trade, and it's way harder than it's ever been given the flat cap and the no space. I mean. I think I think I read today 16 teams are in LTI already. Yeah. Well, they don't have any room. No. Zero and so, room. you know, so and it's probably early for those teams right now to say, yeah, we'll sacrifice um some of our future assets for you know, an impact player now. It's probably a little early for that. And so they they're in a they're in a tough spot. It's um it's been you know, certainly a very disappointing start in Vancouver. And it's, and I just, I don't know, I'd be more surprised if, if they can turn this thing around a little bit um, to save everybody. But I, I mean, I would be more surprised than not right now. They just, they look like, as you, as we got, as I started on this, they look like the players feel like it's the change is there. And that's a, that's a bad spot to be. Those are your headlines. Thank you once again to our good pals at Boston Pizza. Ray Chris Abbott is a presentation of Batano.ca, now available in Ontario. Batano, the game starts now. Uh, Unfortunately, Chris Abbott isn't here to defend himself. As he shared with us last Thursday, he is hobnobbing in, where is he, Greece? I think he's in Greece. He said he's having connectivity issues. Well, that could be from his apartment too because... you know, he's got connectivity issues everywhere. I think it's him. He does. Yeah. Well, he dropped him. a three and four, as did I. He selected the game. It was Dallas Green Bay. We all took Dallas in our varying forms. So we all lose. You dropped a five and two. Uh, again, I dropped a three and four. Stupidly took Dallas in the over. And Abs dropped a three and four. Um, so there's no sense dwelling unless, unless you have a thought on how things went sideways for you, because you, you, you raced out of the gate here in this competition five and oh, and now you're in a bit of a funk. You're in a bit of a losing skid. I'm Um, looking at making a coaching change. (laughs) (laughs) So now what do we do? Who's, who's going to pick the games? I don't like picking games. No, you you guys are going to be all over me. Yeah. But you got to pick because abs, abs picked last week and. You know, I picked up the ball. I think four, but here, here's yeah. the thing. As we left yesterday or last week, Ab said, I'm telling you the real play here is just, I'm not going to do it, but the real play is just to take the over. Which I did. No, but, but he said, just, just take the over. Don't be teasing yeah. it. Don't be doing it. I just take the no, over, I know. fade the Packers if you want. But he goes, that's the real play, but I'm not going to do it. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. That's the, that's the old, uh, 
reverse lock of himself. I'm, I'm kind of surprised that maybe he did do this, and he'll share on Thursday if he can get his connectivity issues resolved. Maybe he hedged. Maybe he did both and just didn't tell us. So for oh, the sake could. of our game and the podcast, <clears throat> he's he's only going to acknowledge that he lost and dropped to three and four. But in his professional world, maybe put some cash down on the over. Well, I, know, I know he did put know. some cash down on his favorite player, Tage Thompson, to score. Uh, that it was against does. Vegas, and Thompson yeah. scored again. So, Yeah. All right, speaking of, why don't we quickly um, – he, you know, Abs would have wanted to talk about this. The Stanley Cup favorites and the winners are already out, right? And you can check that at botano.ca. Um, I don't know if this should come as a surprise to this point of the regular season. Probably not. I mean, the defending Stanley Cup champs still look real solid, don't they? So you've got Colorado at plus 500, followed by Boston at plus 700, and then the Vegas Golden Knights at plus 900. Um, then a few teams, Ray, Carolina, Toronto, the Florida Panthers, all at plus 1,200. Right. I'm trying to think that there'd be a surprise for you in any of this. Well, I'm, I'm looking down the line here, and it's, yeah. it's kind of cool to look and go, hey, you know, what if, what if this team won? What if, you know, maybe I could, you know, put a few bucks here <clears> and, <throat> you know, and, and take somewhat of a long shot. But you get past about – eight of those nine of those teams and i'm like well could the rest of them really win like yeah. could they and so the the ones that you know i still think the rangers are going to be pretty good because i think the team they'll have past march 3rd is not the team they have right now yeah. you know like plus I, 1900 I think, right now yeah. yeah i i think they'll change a bit i'm just looking for teams down in that mid-range and yeah um, yeah you know but but that's really you know i i don't we, thought, we talked about St. Louis as the door closed. Like, I mean, if you're just going to put some some cake down, um, well, I would I would put it on Pittsburgh return. before I'd put it before, would, on eh? Pittsburgh before St. Louis. I, the Penguins can't be as bad as those seven games in a row that they lost. Right. Um, how about Kasperi Kapanen in a healthy scratch? I Jeez. know. <laughs> you know, they got another year at three point two this year plus next year. Um, yeah. They signed him in the off season, which kind of surprised me, but. I mean, he is, um, he's a healthy scratch, and they've started to win a couple of games. All right. Chris Abbott, hopefully will reconnect with us on Thursday. His oh, and we got to start looking at the World Cup, too. I mean, we're getting, we're getting right up to first kick. Oh, very. Quick. That's true. Okay. Well, we'll get Abs thinking about that. Um, every time he visits, brought to you by Batano. Check him out, batano.ca. The game starts now. All right. Ask Ray and Driggs anything. As we get set to land the plane, you know, land the plane. Land it, please. <laughs> guys. Guys. You can send us your questions on Twitter, Instagram, at Ray and Dregs, or on the website, rayandregs.com. Um, we've got an international question, and this this must come from the number of conversations we've had on the Ray and Dregs podcast, you know, about the coach's challenge, you know, and we, we have our differing opinions on what might be a better idea. You know, I mean, again, most recently we had the uh, Trevor Zegers goal call back 29 seconds after the Ducks had entered the zone offside. Way too long. <clears throat> so Benny from our website, Ray, and I, I'm not, I think Raheem, yeah, Raheem has phonetically spelled this. The pronunciation is there. Benny Strom is a listener from Jamtland, Sweden. Cool. Awesome. So, yeah, Benny, ben, welcome to the podcast. Benny gets the shout out for, for, yep. for joining the Rain Drake's podcast. He says, how about decriminalizing the offside rule? That's a word that isn't used often enough on hockey podcasts. Decriminalizing the offside rule. Everything the same. If you want a review, it will be a question of did it affect the play or not? Not this stuff about millimeters and the forensic. I don't mind it. I don't mind it, Benny. However, more opinion is always a bad idea. (laughs) Um, I had, I'm not going to say, because I don't know if the ex-official wants me to say his name, but I had a ex-official reach out and say, 
and give me his idea, which I think one, I had never thought of it. I never heard mm -hmm. of it. And I'm like, wow, this thing actually makes sense. He said, what if there was a thin line, 18 inches or two feet inside the zone? And if, if the play is in there, there is no review. Wow. It's still offside. Like you're still calling offside the way it is. But right. you can only review if it's outside that 18 inches. Yes, you There's would still. There's a gray area. <laughs> yeah, you would still. Yeah, but you would still have a determination 18 inches inside the line. He said, yeah. but chances are the linesmen never miss that call. Yeah. They just don't. They're too good. And that's quite a distance. Um, and I thought, wow, that would take away more potential challenges because it <clears throat> there is unintended consequence to this stuff that they didn't, there's no way they thought this rule was going to get out of hand like it is because no. Zegras's Zegris's goal should count. Yeah. In, in, in my opinion, I, I get it was offside. He lifted his foot. He carried it over the plane of the line. I get it. I get it. I get it. But that goal should count 29 yeah. seconds. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. I'm with you. But, and, and look, just defend hockey ops, the NHL head office. The reason they didn't bring in video review, for years. And we've been talking about this for two yep. decades, honestly, you know? Um, and I mean, it, it, it became necessary when Matt Duchesne, then of the Colorado avalanche was 12 feet offside. Right. So that's when hockey ops went, okay. Uh, I mean, that's obviously an egregiously missed call. So we've got to clean this up. But I, I distinctly remember Mike Murphy, Colin Campbell, Chris King, all of those people in hockey operations at the GM meetings going, guys, I'm trust me. You, you can't put the genie back in the bottle. Once we right. start with this stuff, then you're taking the judgment away from the on-ice officials, and we are going to be chewing over minute calls. And that's exactly what we're are today. You're 100% correct. Um, I remember hearing it too. I remember, you know, in the meetings that I've been to that they talked about it, Gary Bettman has said the same thing. Once you start... It's going to be really hard to stop. And now we're, you know, all these years later, now we're debating which play yeah. should be reviewed and which yeah. shouldn't. And it's, uh, to me, I don't, I don't know if it's made things better or not. All right. Um, let's go to an old question. Brad Rempel has been very patient with us here on the Rain Dregs mm -hmm. podcast. He's been sending um, a question regarding the Winnipeg Jets for quite some time. We yep. just haven't been able to get to it. So uh, Brad is asking Ray, and we figured out the enigma that is the Winnipeg Jets. And he's probably going back to earlier in the season. But no big offseason trades, as some speculated. I mean, cap issues, a big factor in Winnipeg, no different than a lot of teams around the league. Blake Wheeler, of course, no longer the captain of the, the Winnipeg Jets. So now, if we can fast forward and just alter the question a little bit, what is going on in Winnipeg? And are we surprised that the Winnipeg Jets are at the top or – battling for top spot in the central division. Well, I, I am. I'm surprised. Yeah, yeah. Um, I didn't see it. Uh, we'll start with Wheeler. Um, you know, that's a hard one for, for Rick bonus to go in there and say, okay, I'm going to long time captain. I'm going to take the C off and um, we're going to, you know, we're going to use it more by committee, but what that, what that had done, there'd been, there'd been enough talk that they needed some change in Winnipeg and that's a pretty seismic change. And, and, yeah. You know, I know Wheeler addressed it before the season, but you got to take a large bite of a ego sandwich there to have the C taken away and to just move on to, right. To just go, okay, I get it. And I'm going to, you know, I'm going to be part of the leadership group, but I'm not going to be the leadership group. Uh, the Jets, there's been plenty of talk about how that room is changed and opened up. And it, of course, it's easy to say, yeah, it's all because Wheeler isn't the captain, but that's not true. It's that more people get drawn into that vacuum. And so more people take ownership of the leadership of the team. But that's that's one part. The second part is Hellebuck stopping the puck 93% of the time. 0. So 9, 3, good 5. right now, man. Yeah. And then look, like they're doing this. They're 9-4-1, and one, Drake's. Kyle Connor's got two goals. I know. He's yeah. got 10 assists, but he's got two goals. Kyle Connor's going to get 30 goals, 35 goals. He's a fantastic player. Shifley's got 10 goals. He's off to a great start. Wheeler's got 10 points. 
And then, uh, you know, Pierre-Luc Dubois has got seven goals. So if you're, if you're looking for reasons why, yeah, the chemistry might be different. The leadership might be different. The top end of their roster has been terrific. You can't win without it. All right. That's Ask Grand Dregs. Let's wrap up episode 15. Look forward to Thursday. You're at the home office in BC. So what's what's your travel schedule this week? I got nothing until Woo! December. Got Germany the, well, coming up, though. Yeah, I'm, uh, 23rd, I'm going to Germany. So that's what's yeah. that, eight days from now. So yeah. I'm going to see Landon in eight days and looking forward to that. Uh, but between now and then, nothing. Um, Cammy's away right now. So mm-hmm. uh, as soon as we hang up, uh, kids to school. Hopefully I get them to the right school on the right time. <laughs> and um, which, which, you know, and then. It can uh, be just, a challenge on occasion. Oh, it can be, can be. And um, yeah, just home, looking forward to being around. And then my next game actually is a Leaf game in what? in Dallas. Oh, wow. Um, which is one of two Leaf games I know I've got on my schedule. Um, I'll tell this about myself before I go here. You know, I said to Gord at one, you know, Gord Miller is we're getting ready to, we're comparing schedules at the start of the year. And I'm like, yeah, well, I'll see you for sure at that uh, Detroit at Toronto game. And he's like, Detroit at Toronto. We don't have that game. It's in Detroit. Yeah, yeah." I said, it's in Detroit. (laughs) I had the wrong city. (laughs) He goes, you're going to be the only guy wandering around the morning skate. He goes, we're going to be in Detroit. (laughs) <laughs> I'm thinking about Dallas and I'm not going to take this off the rails here as we wrap up, but you've seen the sequence where it was Dallas playing Edmonton and Zach Hyman standing beside Jamie Ben, And they're just having that friendly chat. <laughs> and ben just whacks his stick <laughs> out of his hand. And the next thing you know, Zach Hyman's like basically in a headlock, which I, there's something about Jamie Ben. His game is slowed and all of that, but man, he's just, He's like a throwback, right? Like I just, I he well, makes he had me a chuckle. game. Drags last last week. He had a game, and he was a monster. Yeah, he had a couple of goals. He was, I think, he had seven hits, and like there are times when the tumblers all click. And <laughs> oh boy, he's a hard guy to play, man. Oh. He, he's heavy, like big, and and when oh, it, yeah. when it, when he's got his legs, look out. Well, Hyman's just like, what are you doing? But yeah. knowing that there is not a damn thing he could do about it either, that's right? A, that's a bad like... place to be when when you're giving it to when you're trying to give it to someone, and the guy turns to you and goes, "Yeah, what are you going to do?" And you're like, well, "Yeah, nothing. you're you're, you're not, yeah, no, no. <laughs> All right, buddy. Well, I'm glad you've got some time at home. So, yeah. how about enjoy you? We'll... Busy one or no? Ah, uh, yeah, busy. We've got uh, the Leafs and the Penguins. Strangely. Toronto and, and Pittsburgh play three times in like 15, 16 days, and then yeah. their season series is over. Matt Murray um, making his return. He is, and this is going to be a challenging one for me tonight. Overdrive is taking over the panel. So no James Duffy, no Cheryl Pounder, no Dave Poulin. No, it's, it's Brian Hayes hosting with the O-Dog and Noodles and me. And there's me because I'm the babysitter for this debacle. I'm the zookeeper for these animals. So, Well, uh, Noodles, by the way, Noodles will be there. Take a look unless they can make up oh. and, and fix them up. He took a stick in the coconut the other day. He did. And, uh, oh, that hurts. And here's the other thing. When you're in your 20s and you get a stick like that, it's just part of the game, right? You just yeah, badge like, of honor. You just move and, on. And you're like, oh, that hurt. And you move yeah. on. When you get to be... Noodles age and above. That does not. You do not need that. That's just no. uncalled for. No, no. And he took and, it right inside of the squash there, and so that uh, yeah. they, they better have good makeup for him today. I mean, a valiant shot to the head. The one that is embarrassing is is Craig Button's pickleball. You know, nonsense. Yes. Remember a couple of years ago when what <laughs> smashed his head in playing pickleball. <laughs> All right, buddy. Well, you have a, a good week, and uh, we'll c- reconnect with, uh, I don't know, we'll have some kind of A-list guest, big-time celebrity hockey sensation on Thursday. How's that? Wow, that's quite a build-up. Yeah. I hope get so. on it, because that's, right, that's, that's your department, so get on it. <laughs> you shout out to our partners who make this podcast possible, our title sponsors, and our good friends at Canadian Club Whiskey who ask, are you over beer? By Boston Pizza, pick it up or get it delivered to your door. Just let Boston Pizza do the cooking for you and your family tonight. By Botano.ca, now available in Ontario. The game starts now. And by Dewar, 
Check everything out at Doer at doer.ca. Order online and uh, you'll receive a 15% off discount by using the code RND15. That is episode 15 of the Ray and Dregs Hockey Podcast. Until Thursday, episode 16, stay safe and be well, everybody. Thank you.